This message entitled, In Light of the Last Days, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on January 1st, 2017, by the Rev. Roy D. Warren, Jr. The scripture reference was Revelation 1, 1 to 20. Praise God. Way back in the 1850s, there was a, uh, a pastor who, I don't know exactly how famous he was in the actual day in which he lived. I'm sure he was known by many even at that time, but I think he's known by many, many more people in the years that have gone by. Um, this devotional starts out, this is for uh, the first Sunday of January, and today is the first Sunday of January. Praise God. Um, the devotional goes like this, about this fellow. Discouragement is the occupational hazard of ministry. And we're all in ministry. So don't just think I'm talking about pastors or elders. It's, it's for all of us. Amen? I think we need to be clear on that. Many of God's workers, okay, are disheartened by small crowds and seemingly meager results. Charles Spurgeon could teach them a lesson. Charles Spurgeon could teach them a lesson. It isn't that Spurgeon ever struggled with small crowds. Almost from the beginning, multitudes flocked to his feet. When he assumed his London pastorate in 1854, the church had 232 members. Soon, so many were crowding his auditoriums that he sometimes asked his members to stay away the next Sunday to accommodate newcomers. Might have made more sense to have two services, but anyway, um, that's, that's what he did in the pinch. He seldom preached to fewer than 6,000 at a time, and on one occasion his audience numbered almost 24,000 people. And all of this was before the days of microphones. Did you know this has been here for years and we've never used it? <laughs> we have no amplifier. <laughs> this was only put here to record. And now we have these little electronic uh, gizmos, gizzies, as I call them, to record. And so this is basically for show. Yeah. And someday Bill's going to dig out the other one, and he's going to put it over here. <laughs> anyway, he said he was going to anyway. All right. During his lifetime, Spurgeon preached to approximately 10 million people altogether. 10 million people all together. He also became history's most widely read preacher. Today there, are more there is more material written by Spurgeon than by any other uh, Christian author of any generation. He put out a lot. The collection of his Sunday sermons stands as the largest set of books by a single author in the history of the church. He is called the Prince of of preachers. But ironically, Spurgeon himself is a testimony to the power of a small church. On the first Sunday of the year, and, and that year was January 6th, a blizzard hit England and 15-year-old Charles was unable to reach the church that he usually attended. He turned down Artillery Street and ducked into a primitive Methodist church. Finding only a few people standing around the stove. Not even the preacher got there. A thin looking man stood and read Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and, ye be, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. The speaker, groping for something to say, just keep, kept repeating that. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Look unto me and be ye saved 
all the ends of the earth. He just kept repeating this. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Groping for something to say, he just kept repeating that. And finally, he spotted young Charles in the back, and pointing his bony finger at the boy, he said, look young man, look to Christ. Look to Christ. And the young man, man did look. And Spurgeon later said, As the snow fell on my road home from the little house of prayer, I thought every snowflake talked with me and told me of the pardon I had found. Arriving home, his mother saw his expression and exclaimed, Something wonderful has happened to you. His, his um, biographer later would say concerning this story and concerning what uh, became of him said it is proof that smaller ponds often yield the biggest fish. And I don't mean famous people. I don't mean, you know, everybody in the world is going to know you and you're doing crusades like Billy Graham. But spiritually speaking, a lot of times, the biggest fish come from the smallest pond. This should be encouraging. Amen? Should be encouraging. So, look to Christ today. Amen? Look to Christ. And let Him be absolutely everything. Praise God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. 
and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Would you join me in prayer, please? I want to thank you, Lord, for this gathering today, and I want to thank you also, Lord, for this message in light of the last days. I know, Lord, there are people in this world today that don't believe that we are in these last days. I think your word is very clear about that, that we have been in the last days since Jesus was on this earth. So it's not a matter of trying to figure out whether, you know, the rapture is going to be tomorrow or the end of the world is going to be in eight years or nine years or ten years or anything like that. That's not the point. Lord, you've made it clear, dear God, when Jesus came, that was the beginning of the last days. And those last days have involved all these centuries, dear God, of, uh, of, of the church era, the church years. And we start to get a glimpse of that as we uh, embark on a journey, dear God, through the book of Revelation. And specifically, we are told of these seven churches. These seven churches. And how crucial it's going to be to understand that. So we want to thank you, Lord, for this gathering. I do pray, Lord, you'd put it on the hearts of each one, Lord, in front of this pulpit. That you would indeed, dear God, fill us with your truth, your heart, dear God. And uh, send us forth from this place, Lord, living even more so for Jesus Christ. But I also pray, dear God, that you'd be on the one, Lord, that stands behind this pulpit. I pray, dear God, in the midst of my frailty, dear God, even if I didn't have surgeries coming up and didn't have uh, ailments and, and uh, a hurt arm and all the rest of it, dear God, even if I didn't have that, Lord, I still see me as being very frail um, <clears throat> standing up here. Uh, who am I, dear God, to give the fullness of your truth in the power of the Holy Spirit? Who am I? Who really is any of us? Dear God, to live for Jesus Christ, except, <coughs> except that we have been filled with your Holy Spirit. We have been given the ability and the desire to speak forth and to live forth your truth. So we thank you, we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. There's a story that's told of a rather sedate minister in Scotland. He had in his congregation a poor woman who was in the habit of saying, Praise the Lord! And, Amen! When the minister said something in particular that was helpful to her, just responding with things like that that just gave the glory to God. You know what I'm talking about. Amen? Praise the Lord! Amen! But it kind of threw him for a loop. He wasn't used to the uh, expressing of sentiment and so forth. He was sedate, as I said. And it greatly disturbed him, as it turns out. And then came New Year's Day, and he'll never forget it. On New Year's Day, Sunday, he went to see her. And uh, he said, uh, in the afternoon, he said, uh, Betty, he says, I'll make a bargain with you. Because just that morning she had 
let out a praise the Lord or two, and maybe four or five amens. He says, I'll make a bargain with you. <clears throat> when you call out praise the Lord, just when I get to the best part of my sermon, <laughs> it upsets my thoughts. Now, I don't believe I'm a sedate minister, so don't think I'm trying to tell you to not say praise the Lord or amen. Amen? Amen? amen. amen? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is a story. He says, if you'll just stop doing this, I'll give you a pair of woolen blankets, which, by the way, was a great treasure back in these days and in these uh, colder parts of uh, Scotland. And, uh, and I'll give you a pair of woolen blankets. Now, since Betty was quite poor, the offer of the blankets looked very good. <coughs> Excuse me. So she did her best to earn them. Sunday after Sunday, from then on, she kept quiet. One day, a visiting minister came to preach. A man bubbling over with joy. <coughs> As he preached on the forgiveness of sin and all the blessings that follow. The vision of the blankets began to fade. And the joys of salvation grew brighter and brighter in her heart. And at last Betty could stand it no longer. And jumping up she cried, Blankets or no blankets, hallelujah! <laughs> yes, on that New Year's Day, it all started. The joys of salvation grew, well it started before that, but it certainly expressed itself on that day. Grew brighter and brighter. It shone just as, as much as the sun could. And that's how it is with God's light. For the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a look <clears throat> at the light that surrounds the truth of the last days. Now I don't really mean that we're going to be about trying to discover the ins and the outs and the facts and the figures and the proof texts and all of that uh, that we're in the last days or that it's, it's we're rolling through the last days or anything like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about uh, a light that shines through an expression of what days we are living in today to help us take each step as we take it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm, we're not, this, is a, this is not a lecture series. This is, I'm not going to be all about, you know, proving to you this or proving to you that. That's not what this is about. This is about light that God has given to show us how we take the next steps as we move through the last days. That's different. Okay? That's different. Praise God. In Revelation chapter 1, the light reveals the manifestation that leads to the church age. The days in which we are living right now. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> and I think... I think you'll see this as we go. Alright? Uh, and I'm not going to try to cover every little detail here. I just want to take you through it again. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. Revelation. You know what a revelation is? It's an epiphany. <clears throat> it's, it's something made conspicuous. It's something that becomes known. A revelation is a aha moment. Now I see. Now I get it. A revelation. And this revelation, this whole book, was given as a vision to the disciple John. Alright? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. This is the disciple John. Guy that wrote the gospel. Guy that wrote the three letters. 
and Guy that put down the words of the Revelation. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. The time is at hand for what? To read, to hear, to keep. Amen? So once again, I encourage you, here you are on the first day of the year. You don't even have to play catch up. A lot of times I'll remind you of, of doing this through the year, and I'll have to say, well, you've got three days to catch up. You've got four days to catch up. You don't really have to catch up. You could start right there with that day if you wanted to. But I'm saying, here it is, the first of January. Make a commitment to read through the scriptures, to read through the Bible. And I don't mean just getting the Bible out. I think it's very, very helpful to follow a plan. There's hundreds of plans. They're all over the place. We have one in, right in our newsletter. We've been putting it in our newsletter for years. Now, you don't have to follow that one. We follow one called the McShane One Year Bible Plan. It actually covers the uh, New Testament twice. It covers the Psalms twice. And it covers the Old Testament one time. So it's even more than reading through the Bible in a year. That's the one we followed last year and we're starting again today. Just encouraging you. you. You will not grow near spiritually as God wants you to grow. If you're just, you know, flipping on a, a promise scripture, it gives you one verse. You don't have, a, you don't have the setting. You don't have, you don't have where that verse... I mean, you know where the verse came from. But you, but you don't know what's around that verse unless you read it through. Okay? I think you get a much clearer picture of what the scripture is saying in, an, in its entirety uh, if you follow one of those plans. Okay? So you don't have to play catch up. You can start today. <laughs> there, I mean, just Google it. There, there, there's a lot of them. There's all kinds of different ones. Uh, there's, chrono, there's a chronological one where you hop, skip, and jump through the scriptures and follow it through in order. I mean, in dating order, you know, chronological. Um, kind of like our Bible study has been, you know, chronological. Um, there's lots of different ones. I'm just saying, the last days are for what? For reading, for hearing, and for keeping. Now, how are you going to hear it every day? Sure, you can come here on Sunday, and yeah, Friday night, and yeah, you can hear it, okay? But you can't hear it every day that way. I mean, because we don't have that many times we get together. Almost, with Tuesday and Thursday and so forth, but not every. So, we go ahead and every day, in your devotional time, in your quiet time, what closet time, whatever you call it, you know, get along with God in the Word and, and go ahead and follow a plan. And I'll tell you why I tell you that. Because I know from years past, I mean from years ago, I've been in a plan for many years now, but for years ago, <clears throat> I found it very difficult. Because it, where do I read? I, I don't have something I'm following. I guess that's why the Lord blesses me with a desire to have series. You know, sermon series. I, I, I never really got into just preaching one thing one week and something totally different the next week. I, I, the Lord has, has shown me, most, most of what He's shown me has been through series. Through looking at something, some theme, but throughout. You know, kind of like what we're doing with Epiphany. That kind of thing. Or the Advent season. And those kind of things. I have preached separate sermons, of course. But I'm saying the Lord, uh, Lord kind of leads me in this other direction more often than not. And I think the same thing is true when it comes to the Scriptures. Um, I, I find it difficult, without a plan, I find it difficult to get into this and figure out where I should be. Oh, I suppose you could look at it like, well, I'll just, you know, flip the pages and that's where I'm going to be. Well, if your, if your Bible has been opened to that place several times, it might open to there more often than, than a few times through the year. So you're not going to get a whole picture. I think you get a whole picture of what God is speaking if you go through the whole Bible. You can do it a lot of different ways. You can do it a lot of different ways. You can go through the, you can go through the New Testament, okay, in a year. At the same time, you could go ahead and go through the Old Testament in a year. Well, you might as well pick a plan that does both. But, I mean, you could do it different ways. You know, 90 days of this and, you know, 
150 days of that or something like that, you know. But there are plans that are pretty easy to follow and they just take you right there and there you go. I mention it because the scripture mentions it. I'm not making it up. It says, read, hear, and keep. Amen? It's usually, though, that I forget to mention all this till about a week or two into the new year. And then maybe some of you may feel like, well, I can't start a, that kind of series now. I'm so far behind. Well, but today you're not that far behind. Amen? This is, this is it. This, this day doesn't come along too, too often, you know. This is the first day of the new year. Praise God. And God has given it. And I think part of the reason He's given it is to show us to read, to hear, and to keep. That's what it says. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. You will find it helpful. Don't think I'm ordering you to, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. I'm telling you, you will find it spiritually helpful to um, go ahead and take some time. I know the plan that we are following now. Basically, if, you, if you're just going to read it through, now if you stop and you, and you look up things and all that, it takes a little longer, but, you know, but if, you, if you're just to read it, maybe it takes about a half an hour. Half an hour out of a whole day? You know, I, we can all do it. We just need to do it. That's all. I think you'd find it very helpful. Okay? To follow that through. Don't count on just one verse coming in and do that too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that too. But, you know, Bible says read, hear, and keep. That's what it says. Amen? Praise the Lord. Alright, well anyway, so this chapter goes on though. Uh, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia... Uh, Grace be unto you, and peace from Him which is, which was, and which is to come. In other words, God. (laughs) Amen? And from the seven spirits which are before His throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Marturio is the Greek word here for witness. We get the word martyr from that. Okay? A witness. So if you give witness unto the glory of God, you give testimony, there's a a martyrdom in that. You are laying down your life to tell people about Jesus. Amen? And the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Hmm? Right? So who's going who's gonna to catch on? Who's going to see this? Even those that pierced him. Specifically speaking, of course, to the people that actually hurt him. Killed him. And don't separate it off like so many do and say, well, they did that 2,000 years ago. I didn't pierce him. (laughs) It's because of your sin. It's because of my sin that he was pierced. Amen? It's for all of us. So even those that pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Praise God. I am Alpha and Omega. Now, just to be clear about this, for those that may not know anything about the Greek or, or original languages or anything, Greek is the original language of the New Testament. Okay? And the word Alpha and the word Omega are the words given to speak of the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The first letter of the Greek alphabet is Alpha. The last one is Omega. Okay? It's just like A to Z. It's kind of like that. A to Z. It's Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending. Jesus said, I am that. I am the beginning and I am the end. Saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. So there you go. Jesus is God. Isn't that what it says? It's in red letters, verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, that's Jesus. What does it say at the very last line of verse 8? It says, Almighty, 
Jesus is Almighty God. People try to parse that, try to keep that so separated out and hack it up with a butcher knife and everything else. We got the Father, we got the Son, we got the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the Son, He's not God. No, He's God too. Amen? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's all one God. Amen? Well, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. See, he had been preaching in Ephesus for years. And, he, and John did. And, and uh, he got uh, persecuted, greatly persecuted. And he got sent off to a, uh, what's called a penal colony. Uh, it's a work camp. Um, and it's on this island called Patmos. And so he's away from his church. He's away from his congregants. He's away from his people, the body of Christ. I don't know how many other Christians are there with him. Could be quite a few. Maybe they had their own church services right there on Patmos. I don't know. But it was a hard labor camp. They were building roads in the area and they had to hack up the stones and, and fill it in like, gra like big gravel. Okay, and to make these, and to pat it all down and make it into roads. That's what they were working on. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, John says, while I was on Patmos, and I heard from behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. A voice that sounded like a trumpet. And this is what the voice said. And notice, at least in my version, it's in red letters, which means it's Jesus speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. So now he's, gonna be, he's told, being told you're going to see some amazing things. I want you to write it down. There's no forgetting of this stuff. You know how you think you're going to remember stuff? You know? And so you don't take notes on something? So you, you figure, well, I'll remember that. That really struck me. I'll remember that. You get home and it's like... Right? I mean, in any walk of life, any, anything could be on the job, could be anything. You know? I don't know about you, but I don't write something down on a note. I don't get it over at the store. I mean, it'll be, a, uh, by the time I get home, I remember that I, the, one, the thing I went for, I didn't get. Now, we all do that to one extent or another, I'm sure. So write it in a book. Amen? That's what he says. Write it down and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Unto, he's talking about Asia Minor. He's talking about modern day Turkey. These churches are all in that area. You know that big thumb that sticks out from Arabia? You know what I'm talking about? The, you know, the modern day Turkey? That's what this is. Asia Minor it's called. And there you'll find the churches. Ephesus and Smyrna and, and uh, Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis. And unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. There, if you look carefully... And you've got to look kind of carefully to see this, but those churches kind of form a circle. Geographically, I mean. Sort of a circle. Okay? And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, we, what do we picture? We picture a candle in a holder. Some kind of base, right? Or like the uh, menorah. You know, the, it's got several lights on it, you know, and they light it for their Hanukkah and all of that stuff and so forth. But the word candlestick is, is not referring to a wax candle uh, in a holder. It's referring to an oil lamp. And my thought was to go ahead and bring in a candle and an oil lamp and that was going to develop into my children's sermon. Maybe I should have done it anyway. <laughs> but maybe I'll have another time to do it. Anyway, candlesticks. The Greek word is luknia. Luknia. That's the Greek word for candlestick. And it literally means illuminator. And anywhere you look it up, it will describe it as a small oil lamp. Small oil lamp. So when... Samuel was responsible, even as a little boy, for lighting and extinguishing the various so-called candles. They were lamps. And if you let the oil run out, then you didn't have light, you see. So probably more often than not, 
where the, they were oil lamps uh, instead of, as we traditionally think of candlestick, as a wax candle. Okay? Anyway, what comes from those candlesticks? Light. How do we know that? Because what it means in the Greek is illuminator. And that means a light shines in the darkness. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, now there are seven of them, and the seven in the Greek, in the, I'm sorry, in the Jewish mindset is a number of fullness and completion. So this is as many as there could be to express fullness. Okay? In the midst of the seven candlesticks, representing the churches, representing its pastors, representing its angels. Okay? We'll get to that later. And uh, it says there was one like the Son of Man, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle or a sash across his chest. Okay? It's a picture of Jesus. Repeatedly through the scriptures, it pictures Jesus like this. It glorified Jesus, I mean, after the resurrection. His head and his hairs were, like, uh, were white as wool and as white as snow. And his eyes were like a what? A flame of fire. And what does that represent? Hot. Fire is hot. Right? You don't go sticking your hand in it, leave it there for five minutes. Not unless you're kind of whacked. You know? I mean, that's going to be a serious burn. Um, no. The fire is hot. Fire lights. Fire directs, fire cooks, fire warms, fire does a lot of stuff. Hmm? Yeah. F fire is a powerful picture in the scriptures. Okay? A flame of fire. His eyes were as flames of fire. It doesn't mean they were actually fire, but they were like it. They were like it. Can't you almost picture it? I mean, look at these candles back here. Now, these are electric, but they're flickering, made to look like real flame. Okay? So that's like fire. So his eyes might have looked something like that. Glowing. You know, they say you get into the jungle and you run across some of the big cats. You know, the uh, panthers and things like that. And their eyes glow in the night. His feet like unto fine brass. Now how'd they get to be fine brass or like fine brass? Because they were burned in a furnace. I mean as if they were burned in a furnace. Once again, another picture of fire, another picture of heat, another picture of light. His voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. That is some hand, people. We pictured angels as, you know, cute little babies, you know, fat babies with bows and arrows and Cupid and stabbing people in the heart and making them fall in love and stuff like that. Uh-uh. These, I told you before, every time that I can think of that an angel appears in the scripture, the people have to be told to not fear. Why? Because they are fearing the angel. And why? Because the angel is awesome. The, one of the angels that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, later on, much later on in the book of Revelation, has one foot on one side of the river and one foot on the other side of the river. You don't do that over a 500, mile, or 500 foot rather, wide river. Let's just say it's that wide. You don't do that unless you are big. Right? Amen? And so as seven stars, you know the stars are huge. Right? I mean, they're big. Okay? And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Who's his? His is the sun. He's given a, a, a personal pronoun that emphasizes the fact that this is a reality. That this Son, S-U-N, we're not even talking about Jesus here. That this Son shines in His own strength. He is not reflecting light like the moon does. That's a lesser 
light. But there's a greater light. Namely what? The sun and the stars. Amen? And then the scripture, could I say this? Has the audacity to say, and the stars also. He created this and this and this, and then just says, just simply with, with no explanation, and the stars also. That's because our God is so great that He is to be praised. Amen? Right? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You know, the sun's radius is about 432,000 miles. It's radius. That's half the distance through its center. It's twice that for its diameter. It's really kind of hoping Lily could be here because she is up on space. <laughs> Teacher tells her that in school all the time. <laughs> She, she, she has studied, she has uh, seen videos on it, and she knows a lot about planets, and a lot about stars, and a lot about all kinds of things like that, space type stuff, okay? She would know this radius, I'm pretty sure, all right? Thing is huge! Our sun is huge, and yet other stars are far bigger, far bigger. We're talking big, big, Okay? The temperature at the center of the sun is 29, give or take a degree or two, million degrees. 29 million degrees Fahrenheit at the center of the sun. This is, this is big, and this is hot, and this is light. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, John says. He fainted, in other words, before him. And he, and he laid his right hand upon me, the angel did, or the, uh, the uh, expression of Christ here, did. And he laid his right hand on me, saying unto me, Fear not. Fear not. Once again, red letters. This is Jesus Christ. I was the first... I am sorry, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jesus said. Amen. Amen. That sedate minister in Scotland, by the way, had a thing or two to learn. <laughs> Praise God. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, okay, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. Seven stars in Jesus' own right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks, which I'm guessing are pretty huge too. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. It's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. The angels, by the way, the, word, the Greek word is angelos, has to do with a messenger. So it can be seen in a couple of different ways. One way it's seen is that these are actual literal angels. But another way, and, and it could be both, it can be both, is the pastor of the church. Now John was the pastor of at least one of those churches, Ephesus. But the other, the other churches evidently had pastors as well. Not just Paul traveling around, establishing the churches in the first place, but, he is, um, but they have pastors themselves, the church does. Okay, And these are also the angels of the seven churches. It's all symbolic. It's all making clear that God wants you to see this. Amen? And you can't see it without light. Close your eyes. You're not going to see this. You can't read it. You can't see it. 
You might picture it in your mind, but I'm talking about seeing the words. Amen? Now, you see what I'm talking about? Even before the last days get their start, in the book of Revelation, which is, which is a description of the whole time period, Okay? Even before the last days get their start, because we've not started into the church age yet, or the church compilation of the seven churches. They're being listed in verse 11, they're being talked about throughout the rest of it, and then in chapters 2 and 3, what do you have? You have letters from Jesus to the churches. It's all red letters. It's all Jesus. Message to Ephesus. Message to Smyrna. Message to this one. To that one. Even the Bible says Laodicea. And Laodicea, you remember, was the lukewarm church that he's about to spew out of his mouth. But there's a letter to them too. See the mercy of God. You see the mercy of God. Even in the last days. Even before the seven letters to the churches. Light abounds. We saw it. Candlesticks. Flames of fire. Burned in a furnace. Stars. Sun. We saw it over and over again. Light. Light abounds. Why? For direction. Light gives us direction, doesn't it? You can see better. You go down the basement. You flick on the lights. You can see your way across without falling over something. Well, most of us can. <laughs> Amen? The light wasn't on, though. <laughs> What's that? The light wasn't on. Didn't he say the light wasn't on when he fell? When I, the first time I fell, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Second time I'm in the mall. The light was on. <laughs> Okay, alright. For illumination in the midst of a very dark society, for vision in an otherwise obstructive pathway, God wants to give vision. God gives light so we can see. Amen? But it can't just be, as I said earlier, a stockpiling of information. You know, getting to the point of knowing enough Figuring you don't need to have an ongoing vision along the way. There are a lot of people like that, by the way. They'll go to some Bible conference. They'll go to some church for a few weeks or something. Gather up what they think they need to know. And then quit. And run off to something else. I got a letter recently about a lady who had written or had uh, read our Advent devotional and she said, you know, she's in a church right now and she doesn't know if God wants the, them to stay there. And so all intents and purposes, it looks like they, you know, they might have come here, might have tried. I left a note on the door at the league that we meet here, you know. Anyway, but as the letter went on, you could read into it more. You could kind of see between the lines and, and see between the paragraphs and so forth. She makes it clear that she has been in many churches. And she hasn't left those churches because she's gotten mad at them. But she needs to grow. And I can't grow unless I go to another church. It's called church hopping, people. And the Bible makes it clear. No, you go where God calls you to go. And you settle there. Amen? I mean, this place would be half full, almost, if everybody had just settled into what, where God had led them in the first place. But a lot of people look at it like, well, you know, I, I just need, I need some information, I need some detail, I need, I need to learn this and learn that. So they go and they think they've learned it and then whoop, off they go because they need a new revelation. One guy told me, I need a change. You need a change from the Word of God. You need a change from God leading you and directing you every step of the way. You need a change from that. Don't know that he ever realized that he was way off base on that one. Anyway, but a lot of people take that travel, they take that pathway, not, and, and they think they don't need an ongoing vision along the way. Just go ahead and go to church for a few weeks, gather it up, and then I can kind of sit home and, you know, I don't, and a lot of people just don't even go to church because they think they got it all. They think they got it all. Well, that's not what the church is for. 
The church is for an ongoing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The church is a people working together to, to see Jesus and to know Jesus. And God is the one that gives the light to see that. Amen? God gives the light to see that. I mean, think about it. In the days of Moses, do you suppose there might have been anybody who tried to go ahead and gather up uh, all the manna on one day for the week and then store it away and then they wouldn't have to go hunt it up every day? I'm sure there were because the Bible says that they're, that, you know, not to do that. <laughs> so I have a feeling there were probably some people, the first thing they thought of, I'll go and spend the day gathering and then I'll have it for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And they, they were told that they could go, go ahead and gather on Friday for Saturday because Saturday was the Sabbath and you're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. But if you tried to gather for any other day, it turned bad. I'll bet there were people that tried to do it for the whole week, maybe the month. You know, pour it into one day, you know, gather it up, stockpile it, put it in the back room. And then by the next day, whoosh, stinks. It's got to be a fresh word. Amen? It's got to be a fresh word. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that the mercies of God are new. When? Every morning. Amen? You know, down in the Philippines... And I'll close with this. But down in the Philippines, there's a, there's a flower. And it's up here too, by the way. You can plant it. Uh, in fact, we have it planted around our yard. Uh, some of it came from Cindy's mom's plants. Come up every year. Great big flowers like this. You know the one I'm talking about? The hibiscus. In fact, that was always kind of a connection for my dad and me. We had them at our house. And then we'd go visit towards the end of summer when they were really out, you know. <clears throat> and he had them in his yard too. And my mom was into gardening and, and planted things and so forth. And it's probably something she planted in there. I don't know if they're still there or not now. Uh, but we go every year, like in the late summer, a lot of times, early fall. And we'd go and I'd go out there and take a look at his hibiscus. And he'd have them, I mean, they were like that. And the flowers were like that big. Um, and uh, so it kind of made a connection. There, we talk about the hibiscus for a bit and new every morning and, you know, and, and all of that. And uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, there's white, there's red, I suppose there's other colors, might be pink, I don't know what all they have. Um, we have white ones, we have red ones. Um, and my, uh, my dad had, I think, both of those colors too, might have even had some other colors, I don't know. Some are, some are yellow. Some are orange to even a deep red. I've seen the red. They seem to grow everywhere throughout the days of the year in the Philippines. Not here. They wouldn't make it in the winter. Okay? But they, they do blossom and they're big. They're huge. They color the countryside in the Philippines with great splashes of color and beauty. The blossoms have many shapes. And many textures. I've just seen the big dinner plate ones that are about that big. Just as flat as a dinner plate. With red in the middle, you know, and, and white all around or red all around. Yellow and so forth. <clears throat> but the bloom only lasts one day. And then it kind of dies out. Next day, another one or three or four or whatever will, will bloom. But then they, they're done. That means that a bouquet of these, if you were to cut them off, put the, bringing them in the house and so forth, a bouquet isn't going to last real long. Individual flower doesn't last real long. A bouquet doesn't last real long. And so it is with God's steadfast love, which comes with freshness to us every morning. God did the same thing with the manna in Moses' day. Provided fresh manna each morning for the children of Israel. So he provides for us each day renewed mercies, renewed faithfulness, renewed, renewed everything God is. He's new every morning. Amen? And he gives of himself new 
every morning. Oh, I don't mean you go ahead and figure, well, everything I learned yesterday, I'll go ahead and forget right now, and I'll start all over again today. I don't mean that. But you can't live on yesterday. Not and make it. You can't live on yesterday. You can't live on the week before and the week before that and the week before that. That's what people try. That's what people want to do. That's why they come, they get their knowledge, they get their, thing, their things that they want, and then they run off. But the Bible says we need to be there to receive it day in and day out if we're really going to grow in Him. We must gather the fresh manna every day. Amen? I remember I used to go out and I'd take pictures of this hibiscus. And you'd have to, first of all, go ahead and clear off the browned ones, you know, the ones that are dying off. You know, it might take longer than 24 hours, but it doesn't, they don't last long. And you've got to go ahead and pick the old... If you want to take a nice picture of the bush, you don't want a bunch of dead ones lying around. Well, that's what we become. Dead. If we're not new every morning. Amen? In the light of the last days, we live this life settled in the steadfastness of His love. And that's each day. That's every day. That's today. That's tomorrow. See, I'm not just talking about New Year's Day. I'm not just talking about the first day of the year and how special that is. You know, I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a new beginning. People should see it that way. But then we go ahead and take each step in the light of His love. Amen? Each step. But we need that illumination. We need that flashlight, so to speak, that leads the way. Today, tomorrow, the next day, and all of the way down to the last day. Not the last of days, for we are in the last of days. But it's going to go day by day by day until finally the last one does come. And may we be found in His light in that very last one. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. In light of the last days, that's what we're heading into. I mean, that's what we're starting to take a look at. Praise God. Amen? I can't think of a better place to start than on the first day of the year. Amen? I mean, there's like no ketchup. It's like, it's all mustard. <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, there's no ketchup. Praise the Lord. Well, God's going to take us each step of the way if we will go every step of the way in His light. Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. Let's pray, would you? Hallelujah. Let's pray before the Lord. Father God, we just want to thank You for Your mercy and grace today. Help us, Lord, to be a people truly on fire for You. Help us, dear God, Lord, to, uh, to see that light and to live in that light and hunger and thirst to continue to be in that light, and not be satisfied with some light we saw last week. Oh, I saw this on Tuesday. I saw this on Wednesday, and so forth. And that's all fine and good. But Lord, we need to see you fresh every day. So Lord, we read, we hear, we live. And I thank you, dear God, that your mercy and grace does shine, it does direct us. It does take us every step of the way. May we desire that step today to take us into tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'd like you to turn to, uh, to number 253. 253. Praise the Lord. We'll close with this. 253. Praise the Lord. Silent night, holy night. Praise God. 253. Amen. Silent <laughs> night, holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep.
silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight, glory stream from heaven afar, heavenly hosts sing this last verse and saying it says that Jesus was Lord at his birth and it says that but the previous verse and the verse before that says he was Savior Amen? Christ the Savior is born now think about that because we all have a tendency to think we're talking cross when we talk Savior right? His whole life was given Amen? Amen? Praise God. That's one of those epiphanies that just hit me. (laughs) Amen? All right. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this uh, truth here today, this gathering. And you have called us, dear God, to be a gathering people. We thank you for that, Lord. And you are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. We pray this all, dear God, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. Amen. And now may the God of love and the God of grace and the God of mercy be upon each and every one of us as we leave this place to live for Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in God's peace. Amen.